I'm Dr. Valerie Gertsen, and this is my eighth year at Loyola, and I teach music history classes, and I also teach the uh, master's level course in uh, graduate studies, bibliography, and research methods. And uh, that's about it. So I teach history courses from first year students up to graduate students. Well, I went uh, to undergraduate school at Whittier College, which is east of Los Angeles in California. And then I got a master's and PhD at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. In? In musicology, yeah. And that we had to specialize in certain areas as doctoral students, so um, I specialized in 19th century music and American music. And I had a Fulbright to Vienna in 1983-84 to work on a dissertation on Brahms. What musicologists do, musicologists can do just about anything related to music, the scholarly study of music. Some of them uh, do archival research with manuscripts and other sorts of primary documents. Some of them do more analytical work. Some of them do aesthetic, sort of philosoph philosophical work. Some of them do uh, editions, critical editions of music. Some of them work in the area of psychology of music. And then there's a whole range of subjects matter in historical musicology, everything from um, the ancient world, ancient Greece and Rome, through the Renaissance, uh, medieval, Middle Ages, Renaissance, Baroque music, uh, all the way up to the present day, also uh, music of other uh, cultures or different ways of looking at music. There's a discipline that either is uh, a subset of musicology or a separate field, depending on who you're talking to, uh, called ethnomusicology, which deals um, with the study of music and culture and could also include the study of um, Western art music and culture. I think it's extremely important in uh, providing or helping to, for them to gain different contexts for looking at music, for studying music and playing music and listening to music. Uh, I always tell my students that the main thing that I really am hoping they will do is learn how to, to develop their own ideas about music and their own interpretations of musical pieces. And in order to do that, you have to have some skills with analysis and uh, so on, but you also have to know something about the context of that piece. And it might be a historical context, biographical context, philosophical context, uh, style characteristics, a stylistic context, what were the expectations or conventions of music like that in a particular time, and how does that help us to understand what that piece is. Uh, now certainly when that student performs that piece or uh, writes about the piece, um, they can form their own ideas and they don't have to do it the way Mozart's contemporaries would have done it or Bach's contemporaries would have done it, but I think that understanding that context, the whole background of it, and the performance context too, gives them some ideas that then they, as a musician, can choose from or develop in their own way. And so what I'm trying to get students to do is to think for themselves <laughs> and to um, then be able to articulate their ideas both orally and in writing. And so I have, they write papers, but they also do a lot of oral presentations and discussions in class. I was a pianist, uh, I mean I took piano lessons as a, as a young person starting about the age of 11. And I went to Whittier College expecting that I would be a mathematics major or possibly major in Spanish because I was very fond of foreign languages and I still love the study of languages. And when I filled out, I don't remember exactly how this happened, but I had never really had any formal study of music theory or music history outside of piano lessons. Um, and I signed up for my first, you know, basic music one, just as kind of an elective, and I just fell in love with it. And uh, I like everything about it. <laughs> um, 
and of course I'd lived in the world of that music for some time, even though I don't come from a family that has uh, a lot of background in Western art music. They don't know. But, uh, but my mother always sang, like she sings all day. She just sings. She's a natural singer. Uh, and music was important to me. And then when I got to college and started seeing how some of these things went together, and started to understand the patterns that I had kind of intuitively known about but not really understood, I just got really excited about it. And I gave, um, you know, I was a piano, well, we didn't really have to say what we were. We were music majors and there weren't very many of us. So we did everything. And uh, I gave my recitals and so on a piano and I studied organ and voice. But, um, but mainly I was preparing to go into grad school. And so my advisor, who was a musicologist, made it very clear that I needed to be studying French and German, and I needed to be studying history, and I needed to be studying literature, and I needed to be doing these things to be ready for that. I'm not sure exactly who would that, that would be. At Illinois, I had several really fine teachers. They had, um, when I was there, and it may still be true, they had seven musicologists on their staff with different specialties. So there were a lot of good role models there. Um, my advisor, Nicholas Temperley, was really important in um, just sort of showing faith in me, but also uh, I had graduate assistantships where I taught and then he took me on as a re his, his personal research assistant and I worked for him for I think three years on various projects, editing projects and uh, indexing projects and bibliographies and uh, anything that came up. And I also worked for him for a year very early on in my graduate career as the editor. He was the editor of the Journal of the American Musicological Society. And I worked for him sort of answering letters and processing articles and sending them out to reviewers. So I got to see all that. Um, but beyond that, I'm not sure. I just, I just developed, you know, I wanted to keep going with interest. I was very interested in the music of Brahms. I had played it as an undergraduate and just really loved it and uh, wanted, to, wanted to know more about it and felt that maybe I had something to contribute there. We all bring little bits to the canon, right? It's like small bricks, unless you, uh, in, in musicology, there are kind of two ways to go. You can either uh, take up with a, co a composer or a subject that nobody's ever worked on and pretty much spade it out from the beginning and start uh, and establish that whole area. Or you can put the little bricks in uh, a, a building that's already been built or is being built for a long time. Uh, what I did was a little bit of both of that because I worked on, um, on my dissertation, I worked on Brahms's piano arrangements of his own works and works of other composers. And when I started working on them, uh, I didn't even know exactly what those were or how many of them were there. There are about 40 of them. Uh, Brahms arranged his own uh, orchestral music all the chamber music for four or more players for piano four hands or two pianos. And this was a way that uh, in a time way before recordings that people could get to know his music and uh, study it at home. Maybe they were going to have a chance to hear it and they, they wanted to study it ahead of time. Maybe they would never hear it, but they wanted to get to know it. Uh, and Brahms and his friends also did a lot of playing of these uh, transcriptions or arrangements. And then he arranged music of other composers. Um, Robert Schumann, of course he was very close to, and Franz Schubert, and his friend the violinist Josef Joachim had composed three overtures. They were about, he and Brahms were about the same age. They were about 20, 22 years old at that time. They were young people, they were like the age of our students. And uh, they were both trying to kind of find their own way, their own voice, their own compositional voice in the 1850s. And so Brahms arranged some of Joachim's music, I think, to get to know it and also to try to help promote that for his friend. 
Uh, and so I did that dissertation a long time ago, and that's what took me in, uh, to Vienna to study the primary sources. A, a lot of these pieces were never published, or, uh, or some of them were never published, and the ones that were are not available for the most part in modern editions now. Um, so I did a lot of work with manuscripts and you know, primary documents, and it was a real learning experience because nobody had really trained me in that. It's just, you just have to learn it by doing. Um, and now I'm, uh, I'm editing a volume for the new Brahms edition, the new collected edition that's coming out that'll be 65 volumes of Brahms's music. Uh, there was a, an edition, a collected edition put out in 1927, um, but it doesn't contain all these arrangements. So I'm doing editing a volume, not all of them, but a, a, a volume of the, of the arrangements that's in, um, they have it, it's in Germany. They're, they're translating parts of it and, and working through parts of it with me now. So I guess what I've contributed um, is more a, a kind of view of, of Brahms, you know, great composer from the point of view of more regular people, which is something that interests me very much. Uh, the musical life of people across different groups and in, uh, in a society and how, uh, the sort of realities of musical life and what, how people got involved in music and what they, they did about it. Uh, you have to take into account the context of the time. Um, often in, well, sometimes in classes there, there's not really enough time to go into all that as much as you might like. And you can, uh, I will sometimes assign, especially in the upper level courses, courses assign readings that perhaps students can learn some of that, and then we can bring that to the discussion, because the world is big, you know, once you start going into all those things. But, but yes, I think that's, that's important. And, uh, you know, Brahms, like any composer, I would guess most composers, is very much a part of the world he lives in. And what he does reflects that, in a way, and reflects who he is, and some of, sometimes those things are hard to really pinpoint, but, but I think they're there. That's a very difficult assignment in a way. It's a very fun assignment, but uh, it's difficult because people will come here with many different backgrounds. And some people have been uh, studying music and in a kind of theoretical, analytical way for a long time, and other people have not. They may be just as good a musician or a better musician, but they haven't got that sort of experience. Um, some people have sung mainly in choirs, some people have played in orchestras, some people have played in jazz bands, some people have played piano basically as a solo instrument without other people. Uh, some people have sung, uh, in operas and so on, so they all have, they have a very different skill set <laughs> that they bring to the class. And so one of the challenges at the beginning is just trying to get some basic common ground that we can draw upon. And so what I've come to do over the years is I've realized that I need to spend uh, some time at the beginning kind of going over basics and fundamentals. And I try to do this in a fun way, not like a week about rhythm, but uh, try to, choose, usually I'll choose uh, songs or other pieces and use those as a basis for discussion of those things, rather than just attack the topic as a, as a category, as a, a topic devoid or apart from music. Um, and then we just kind of, uh, I also usually have uh, students come in and present instruments or their voice. To, because often students will not know what's really involved in playing the oboe or what is that thing on the violin that, you know, <laughs> why do you do this or why do you hold it this way or why is your hand wiggling in this hand? Uh, and that's a chance for them to find that out. Uh, and so I'll have woodwind day when everybody who plays a woodwind will bring their instrument to class and come up to the front of the class and talk about their instruments and play a little bit for us so we can see what it sounds like. And then I have string day, and then I have percussion day, and brass day, and piano day, and voice day. <laughs> and then I get them, I guess I've got them all now. Uh, and some interesting instruments come through the door. You never quite know what to expect. But that's also a chance for students to, uh, 
to get to know each other and to find out what's important to them. Oh, I forgot guitar. Guitars come in too, and electric basses. Uh, we do that. Uh, often I will have students write about music that is important to them, either as a kind of getting to know you exercise or as a longer paper. Uh, Dr. Clark and I both like to use um, what she calls desert island discs, which is if you could take two CDs to a desert island with you. Uh, of course, now there's an iPod, but if you could take, <laughs> in the old days, if you took two CDs to a desert island, you know, what would be on them, or if you took them into outer space or whatever. Uh, and so that students have to make up the table of contents and then write about some of those pieces and, and explain what is it about that music that's important to them. Sometimes it's actually something about the structure of the music. Sometimes it's a biographical importance or something that happened in their life or for some reason. Um, and that's a way too for me to get to know who the students are and sort of where they are and what their interests are. And then I try to draw on those as much as I can, you know, to some extent. And then the way the course has been structured in the last few years um, that, that we've kind of developed this way to be a series of case studies of four or five pieces. So we don't try to do the whole horse race through music history one semester and this deep, but we instead, as if you were in an English class and you were going to study several books, well, we're going to study several pieces. So these students will buy their scores, and I make recordings available, and I put readings on Blackboard, on eReserve, and I basically ask myself, what things would I have to know to make sense out of this? And then we just start there and see where we go. <laughs> um, and we never have enough time, but uh, we do what we can with that one, and we move on to the next one. Well, the analysis of music, um, What I guess what I'm really going for is for students to, to, uh, to learn some tools, some strategies for how they might face another piece of music because I will not always be there for them when they encounter a new piece of music. Uh, so for example, if we're studying a symphony by Mozart, well, there are certain expectations that one has for a symphony by Mozart. You think, well, it's probably going to be in four movements. What's a movement? Well, let's talk about that. Uh, what are, and then each one of those movements will have specific characteristics that are conventional, and then other characteristics in a particular work that are maybe not conventional. But if you know what the expectations are of sort of harmonic structure, of form, and so on, then you have a better understanding of what Mozart is doing, and sort of what he's playing with. It's sort of like a, you know, a jazz player might play with a sort of um, a series of chord changes or something. If you know what's the given, then you can better understand and appreciate the added, the what's not given. So we're definitely going to learn uh, for first movements, we're going to learn that they usually are fast, fast tempo, and that they usually are going to conform to some version of sonata form. So we have to learn what sonata form is, and some students have an idea of that, and some of them have no idea of that, even when they're sophomores or juniors. It depends on what their background is. Um, so uh, I, I like to use visual maps of them that I make and that I post. And we do them together. Sometimes we map them together at the board. Sometimes I have people come up and, and try to do them. And then we critique, <laughs> critique each other's maps or diagrams. Um, sometimes there are listening outlines that you can find that actually give you the digital count and walk you through. At this, at you know, 58 seconds, we hear theme two. And that's in the key of this. And at a minute and 30 seconds, we hear the return of the, or the repeat of the exposition. Uh, those are helpful for some people, and I try to think about as many ways as possible to try, because people learn in different ways. And just because I, it really helps me to have like a visual diagram doesn't mean that that's going to do it for everybody in my class. Some of them need, you know, there are all sorts of different ways to do it. I've heard of people building sonata forms in uh, shaving cream and popsicle sticks. I've never actually tried that, 
but it's not a bad idea, right? If you had to, you could give students a kind of pile of materials like they used to do in sixth grade sort of gifted classes, right? And have you construct a model that reflects certain characteristics of that that you think are important. That's a good idea, actually. I have to try that. <laughs> uh, sonata form uh, really comes out of, uh, it's a special kind of rounded binary form. Uh, that's the way it was understood in the 18th century. So we go back to all those little binary dance movements of the Baroque. And um, Dr. Clark normally teaches History One, so I, when I start History Two, we're right at that point. We're at the point that kind of the juncture or the overlap between Baroque, the early part of the 18th century, and the later part of the 18th century, and there's actually an overlap there, and I go back and overlap you know, with what she did. Um, and so if you get the idea of binary form and then rounded binary form, referring to the fact that you bring back part of the, of the first section, the A section, at the end of the B section, and both halves are repeated, then that sets up your idea for sonata form as it was understood in the 18th century as a two-part form. You know, we tend to think of it now as exposition, development, recap in three parts, but they thought of it as two-part, exposition twice, development, recap twice. And if you look at those um, early, if you look at scores of early uh, symphony movements, first movements, sonata form movements, the second half's repeated, the repeat bars on it. Um, so they heard sonata form as a special kind of binary form, and it's defined by harmonic structure. The first half moves from tonic to new key, usually dominant or relative major if it's in a minor key. The second half moves from that point back to tonic, that's its goal. So they heard it divided harmonically that way. And if you start to think about it that way, it makes it a whole lot easier to make sense of some of these um, earlier sonata form or earlier symphony movements that don't seem to want to behave the way that we want to impose on them <laughs> from our later, you know, later viewpoint. You know, that's an area we could be better at here. Um, at Illinois, we had a couple of very influential ethnomusicology professors, and one of my teachers was Bryn O'Nettle, who's one of the, not really a founder of the field, but pretty close to it. Uh, he's now um, uh, 80 years old, so he's been around a long time, and I think he got his doctorate when he was about 25 or 22, very early. And his father was Paul Nettle, who was a very, um, esteemed uh, musicologist in Western music, and they came, uh, they were Czech. Uh, and so I was trained also in ethnomusicology, and I'm also married to an ethnomusicologist, so I, I've been with that field for several decades. <laughs> I've been married 30 years, so. Um, and the first job that I had, the first uh, real job that I had was at Wesleyan in Connecticut where they have a fabulous world music program and I was hired to teach Western music in a world music context, which is a particular kind of thing to do. You always have to be branching out and looking beyond. And I try to do that as much as I can in my classes. Uh, the classes that I, I have taught world music here I did that once, um, but someone else is doing it now. Um, but uh, I think it comes down, for me it comes down to a matter of focus and also staffing. That is my principal expertise is in uh, European and American music, mainly of the, of the art music, the sort of art music tradition, if you want to call it that. Although I have done work in other traditions, and I've done research in folk music, and uh, I revised one of Bruno Nettle's book, and I have some, some background in that, and certainly I have interest in it. Uh, 
but it's not the, the material that I know the best. So yes, it's absolutely worth teaching. And if we had more bodies on the ground, uh, as it is, you know, Dr. Clark and I really can hardly cover what we'd really like to do. Uh, it's very rare that we get to offer a um, sort of a, a special seminar on something that's really important to us because we're so busy doing the courses that need to be taught that students must have in their degree plans and must take. Uh, and that would just require a, a bigger faculty and you know, at least one more person. And maybe that will come someday. Um, we could easily have uh, a kind of um, another musicologist on staff who did uh, any number of topics, including ethnomusicology, including uh, courses that would be targeted more toward the toward Loyola at large, the general university. Uh, I have to say that I'm mainly concerned with our majors here because that I have to be, and I and I enjoy it. I love them, but uh, there's not often a chance to design something, say, for the common curriculum or that we have to first X out something we're already doing to be able to take that on. This fall I'm not teaching orchestral lit, but normally I do. And I always email Jean Montez and say, what are you doing this year? <laughs> because it's the mainly the instrumentalists, the orchestral instrumentalists who are going to be in that class. And I may as well know what it is that they're working on and then we can, you know, adjust our syllabus. You know, I, can cha I change my syllabus up a little every year because I don't want to teach the same pieces over and over. There's so many to pick from. Um, so I do try to take advantage of that, that opportunity. Um, we probably could do more kind of collaborative work. Dr. Frazier has asked me to come in to give a lecture in connection with the performance of the Bach St. John Passion this spring. So I'm going to be doing that. Um, and we could probably do more than that, more of that sort of thing. I think it would be a good thing. It would be very good for students. Well, I have had in individual students come to me and say, you know, because she studied this particular piece for a paper that she was writing, that she plays it differently to now. And that, to me, is a great, it's a great thing to hear. It's just because now I sort of get it in a way that I didn't get it before. Well, she's a tremendous... Uh, tremendous instrumentalist, but uh, she just didn't know the, the sort of context for it. There are a few of them that I've gotten emails from or calls from or they'll come back into town and drop in and, and come and see me and it's wonderful. It's wonderful to see what they've been doing and uh, uh, if they go to grad school, whether, you know, what we did here helped, you know, <laughs> help them and, and what, how they've built on that. And I, you know, I've had some very wonderful encounters that way. Um, I guess it was two or three years ago, I went to New York um, before Christmas to, to work in the Pierpont Morgan Library. And I stayed a friend with a friend of mine there. And uh, she and I, she wanted to go to this little Christmas show at this little church near her house. So we went in the evening, and one of my students was there in the, up in the balcony, and she came running down later, Dr. Gertzen, Dr. Gertzen. It was just, uh, she was studying in New York. She was studying bassoon. Um, and she was one of the Costa Rican students that had been here and, and studied bassoon, and then she graduated, and she went on, she was studying uh, I don't remember exactly where in New York. Um, I think it was at Juilliard, but she, you know, it's just really exciting. And then to hear what they've been doing and how they've built on, on what they've learned. And I wish I knew more of that. I wish I had more of that. I don't think that I'm very scary, but I know that my subject is scary to people. And so I'm aware of that. Uh, and I've tried to be 
uh, as I've been doing this longer, you know, I've been in Loyola, at Loyola a long time, I've tried to be more proactive about it because I find that the results are almost always good. If you will email a student and say, I'm concerned about you, uh, you know, you didn't do well, everybody knows you didn't do well in the test, you got the test back and you failed it, right? But I'm concerned about you uh, either because they're not doing well or they're absent a lot or they don't, they fall asleep in class or whatever. Uh, and usually, I, I'm always surprised by how grateful students are for that. And to me, it's a small thing, but uh, I think it's sometimes a very great thing, a very large thing to them. I had a student the other day, I, pa I n didn't know he was going to do so poorly on a test, but, uh, but I knew he was struggling a little bit. And he was out working in the hall, and I went by and I said, are you keeping your head above water? And he said, yes. And then he emailed me later and said how much that meant to him that I would check on him and care. Well, I was just, you know, I care, but I was just didn't think it was a big thing. So I'm realizing that many students need that, need the personal invitation. I can stand up in front and say, please come and see me, make an appointment, email me, and but if I actually contact them and say, I have some time Wednesday afternoon, why don't you come by and let's talk about this, it puts you on a completely different relationship. And it will sometimes really, really help them. I have really loved it here, and I hope I never leave, because uh, it, to me it's been such a wonderful community, and I felt so much support for what I do, um, for what I teach, and also for just me as a person, you know, how I'm feeling today or how things are going. And I really appreciate that because I know what it's like for that not to be true. And, uh, you know, I have taught places where uh, students were put kind of in the middle between me and somebody else because another teacher thought that the student was spending way too much time studying for music history and didn't have time to practice. You know, I, I've heard this a lot, and it's really difficult to be in that position. Because then you're nowhere with students if, if their own teachers are just, you know, attacking you because you're giving them too much work or expecting too much of them or won't cut them slack or whatever. Uh, and I've never felt that here. I've never had to defend why a student ought to actually work in my class or take my class. And then I've never had people try to get students out of my class, you know, where they didn't have to take it. Um, the college, I, I really enjoy uh, being associated with artists and, uh, and uh, theater people. Uh, I have a background in art uh, just by doing, it's not a very formal background, but I did take art courses and as an undergraduate, both history and studio art, and it's important to me. And I have a daughter who's a wonderful visual artist. And uh, I am looking forward to, um, when everyone has time, you know, to think further about other kinds of interaction and connections that we can make. There's been a little bit of talk of that, but it hasn't got very far. And I think it's partly because everybody's just so absorbed in what they're doing, that's not a bad thing. But we all, you know, are so fully committed to what we're doing now and our students, it's hard to think about designing a course that's going to be team taught or coming up with a different idea. And some people do it, but it's not happening all that often. I'm sure that the city must be part of it. Um, I think also it's the, the liberal arts connection. I think our, our college is a little unusual in that it functions something like a conservatory, but something like a liberal arts school. And there's, there's really room for all of that, I think. So that we have some students who are training, really focused very hard on training toward a performance career. And you have some students who are much more interested in music as one of the liberal arts, as one of the 
as a way of educating oneself and making life better, you know. Um, and then there's also the Jesuit connection, uh, which um, I didn't grow up Catholic, but uh, I have an appreciation for, and I'm getting to understand more and more as I'm here longer. Uh, and I guess the, the aspect of that that seems, for my day-to-day -day experience here, most important is the, um, the real support of, of other people and concern for other people, both people who are here and people who are not here. Um, and I think that's a very worthy the goal. Uh, truthfully, there are some things. Uh, I, I've been doing some work with uh, Clara Schumann's repertory and actually seeing how some of her programs would play out. And so I've been setting up program, you know, little playlists of uh, of her pieces, of course not played by her, but by all these different pianists, and I cobbled them together into these little programs that I can listen to <laughs> uh, entirely to try to make some sense. And I've gotten some, uh, I'm some further with this, um, of sort of her strategies in putting together programs. Um, I gave a paper on this actually in Italy this past summer. Um, she would, back in the 1830s and early 1840s and probably beyond, when people were not very used to hearing these little character pieces of Chopin and uh, Schumann and Mendelssohn and uh, these people in concerts, that is, they were more of a sort of private repertory, not a public concert repertory. That's where you played your concertos and your big pieces. She would put these together in little mosaics. And she would take a couple pieces by Chopin and one by Schumann and maybe one by herself, one by maybe one of the Bach fugues, uh, the finale of the Appassionata Sonata of Beethoven. She would put them all together to make these little, uh, what were referred to either as mosaics or, um, oh, I forget the other word that I've seen in the, in the periodicals, in the reviews of them. Um, and then she would improvise transitions in between them. So they would turn into this piece that was about the right size for a public concert, but it would have these little moments of different styles and different historical eras. And so I've been trying to make sense out of all that stuff. And uh, you, can look, uh, you can look at lists you know, on the programs and you say, oh yeah, that Chopin etude or that Chopin mazurka, I know those. But when you actually listen to them, you have a lot more insight than just saying, oh yeah, I know what that one's like, and it came first and this one came second. But when you actually listen to the music, you start to pick up on all sorts of ways that those pieces might interact and uh, the way they work together to make a whole. And so that's what I'm playing with right now. So those, that stuff's all on my iPod. My, um, my materials that I'm using in teaching History 1 are, and History 2 are on my iPod. Um, some things my daughter sends me from time to time, some things that I like, some Beatles recordings and uh, other things that I like. Um, but I'm not as um, a constant as an iPod user as some people are. I think differently maybe than a lot of people but I just deep down inside don't think you go to college to get a job. You go to college to build a life and it's just a part of it. And there's so much more that you're going to build after and before, right? Uh, but you go to, on, go to college to be exposed to different ideas, uh, to figure out who it is you are and what you want to be. And the person who starts as a music major may not end up as a music major. You know, I know that was my own experience. Uh, my older daughter went in as an engineer and came out as a political scientist and works in D.C. now. My younger daughter went in, uh, she's in her second year, she's in horse science and thinks she wants to be a large animal vet. But who knows, right? But 
But whatever happens, that won't be wasted because she's learning about something she cares about and she's developing skills and she's learning how to study and she's learning about how to live and who she is and how to organize her time and her thoughts and her ideas. And so in a way, I, you know, I don't see college as a training ground for a profession, really. That doesn't mean you can blow it off and not try. It's important. It's important to do well, to grow as much as you can, to learn as much as you can about things that are really important to you, to develop uh, good relationships with teachers and colleagues and other students, and to learn as much as you can about what you think you might need to know. But most importantly, learn how to find out the rest of it, because we're all still doing that. Right? We're all still trying to figure out what it is we need to know and how to learn it on our own. Music is, is something that, that makes your life wonderful. It doesn't matter whether you, or whether you might do it as a profession or whether you might just enjoy it sort of as an amateur or somebody who doesn't really play and sing uh, or whatever. Uh, that, that music like, makes your life wonderful and it's absolutely worth devoting everything you have to it. But you really have to do that. You can't fiddle around with it and sort of half-heartedly do this and that. I, I don't think you get anywhere that way. You have to be able to give your heart to it and give your energy to it and give your time to it. And maybe you're not always going to be so lucky to be able to do that later in life. Maybe this is your chance. Uh, and that's the way I think about it. And part of the reason I love teaching music students more than anyone else is I never have to explain to them why I love music or defend the study of it or any of that to them because they know. They know what that is. Um, and, and they know what it can do. And so as a teacher, the thing you have to do is to find the connection between that student and whatever subject you're working with to try to if you can find one little connection, then the rest of it can go, right? They have to find one little connection. Um, and it's not too hard. All you have to do is come up with some piece that blows them away. And it's not too hard to find one, right? Because there's so many wonderful, wonderful uh, uh, examples that you could draw on either live performance, either something somebody's doing now or making up on the spot or a piece that lots of people have studied. It doesn't really matter, but to get them involved in that way. So I guess as a parent, you know, I certainly understand the uh, worry of um, sometimes paying a sizable fortune <laughs> to 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 allow a student to go to school, to allow a son or daughter to go to college and major in music, and that seems very iffy to a lot of people. But uh, I think it's a very wonderful choice. And we have musicians, people who are music majors who go on to be lawyers, who go on to be doctors, who go on to be uh, teachers of all various sorts of, uh, all, all sorts, um, other professions, uh, administrators, it doesn't mean that they're, I think sometimes our idea of, of what a music major can be is very small. And it really is very, very big. Because from what I know, and I don't know a lot about this, but from what I know, employers tend to look very favorably on a person who has gotten a degree in music because you know that person has self-discipline, that person has focus, that person has commitment, or they wouldn't have made it. And so that tells you something about them already. <laughs>